great blessing to carry you all, and a special way for those who are from different churches in Lawrence County and other places. We are so pleased and it's a blessed moment to have you with us today, this evening, to hear the talk of our Lord Sandler. God brings certain blessings on a certain time. We all go through a tough moment and for a while and with the pandemic situation we go through some kind of depression and we, we, we blame something and we blame some people. But above all, our spiritual health cannot be affected no matter what goes. And this is a moment that will make us to be more concentrated, focused on our spiritual health. As we are going to listen to the talk of our Lord Sandler, and this will make us to focus on how we can focus on God's blessings rather than the evil things, enticement and temptations in our lives. So it's a great blessing to have our Lord Sandler here with us, Father Tom. Father, we welcome you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's good to be back. I spoke here previously when Father Rick was the pastor, so I'm happy to come back and to be able to speak again. Father Jagan mentioned that he was with me. It wasn't because the Archbishop thought that he needed an exorcism that <laughs> he sent him to be with me, but... Uh, He's a great blessing for our diocese as well. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we ask your blessing upon all of us as we gather here this evening. We recognize that every good gift comes from you. We thank you for the gift of our lives, for family and friends. We lift up in our thoughts and prayers all those who are sick and suffering in any way and all those who have asked for our prayers. May our opportunity to come together this evening to talk on the topic of exorcism be an opportunity for all of us to grow in holiness and virtue and to deepen our commitment to you. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So my goal this evening is to give you a presentation, and at the end of that, I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. So imagine, if you will, that it's Sunday morning in every major city and small town across the United States. And there's a sound that begins to echo in the air. And the sound that we hear is the ringing of church bells. It's a sound meant to remind all of us that we're called to wake up with God and to be about the things of God. But it is a sad reality today that far too many people seem to be spiritually asleep. Many people who have been baptized have abandoned their faith. They no longer go to church and even identify as being an atheist. The truth is that either one is in a relationship with God or in a relationship with something else. And this something else is none other than the devil himself. St. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and he deceives many people. As the gap is growing between ourselves and God, there has been a resurgence in the fascination with the devil. What people need to realize is that our ultimate identity comes from our relationship with God and not apart from him. Faith in God will lead us in one direction and the lack of faith will lead us in another. I was appointed to be the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis back in 2005 by Archbishop Daniel Beekline, 
At that time, I became one of only 12 officially appointed exorcists in the United States. Today, that number has grown to more than 125. I received my training in Rome in the early part of 2006 when I had the opportunity to mentor with a Franciscan priest who had been doing that ministry for more than 25 years. And during the three months that I lived in Rome, I was able to participate in 40 exorcisms that this priest performed and then to learn firsthand the ministry of the church to those who were up against the forces of evil. I've also attended the Vatican course on exorcism. It's held every year in the city of Rome at the University of the Regina Apostolorum. I'm also a member of the International Association of Exorcists. It was founded by Father Gabriel Amorth, the former chief exorcist in Rome, who passed away back in 2016. The International Association is made up of 750 priests from throughout the world and the people who work with them in this ministry. I currently receive about 2,000 calls and emails every year from people all over the United States and even other parts of the world who, again, are seeking help from the church. The Catholic Church will help anyone who reaches out to her. Half the people that reach out to me are not Catholic. They come from other Christian faith traditions, other world religions, or from no religious background whatsoever. Just last week, I received a, an email from a lady in Israel who was seeking help. And the week before, I had an email from a lady in Kuwait who was seeking help. So the calls come from all over. Some exorcists are publicly known, such as myself. And because I'm publicly known, I receive a higher volume of calls. The advantage of working with the International Association of Exorcists is that if somebody contacts me from a different location, then I try to help them connect with the priest in their area who does this ministry. As an exorcist, my primary goal is to help lead people out of Satan's darkness and into the light of Christ. Many people today live with a distorted view of freedom that echoes the fall of humanity mentioned in the book of Genesis. The guiding principles of this distorted view of freedom are this. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. This viewpoint leaves no room for God, and the result is a greater presence of evil, both in the world and in the lives of individuals. It was St. John Paul II who said that freedom in the true sense of the word means to be obedient to God. So hear that again. True freedom and obedience go hand in hand. We cannot have true freedom if we're being disobedient to God. When we live in the manner that God has created us to live, that's freedom in the true sense of the word. When we get a distorted view of freedom, whereby we begin to think that we can do whatever we want, then we end up becoming slaves to our own passions and desires. Pope Benedict put it this way, when the existence of God is denied, then freedom is not enhanced, but is deprived of its basis, its foundation, and thus it becomes distorted. The word exorcism comes from the Greek, the word exorchismos, and it's a term that signifies an insistent request manifested before God or directed against demons. To exercise literally means to bind with an oath. At its very core, an exorcism is a prayer. It's a prayer that brings healing and peace to those who are afflicted by the evil one or his demons, allowing them to be reconciled to God. When God is being asked to expel a demon, we call that a minor or supplicating exorcism prayer. Again, it's a prayer directed to God. Prayers for deliverance would fall under this category. But when a demon or an evil spirit is being addressed, we call that an imperative or a major exorcism. Now, anyone can do a supplicating exorcism prayer on behalf of someone else. Again, it's a prayer directed to God, and we know that anyone can pray to God on behalf of someone else. But in the Catholic tradition, because exorcism is a liturgical rite, we have a prescribed way that it's done. 
So in the Catholic tradition, a command given to a demon may only be done by the priest authorized to do this ministry by his local bishop. Ultimately, the real exorcist in every diocese is the bishop himself. He has that uh, title, if you will, by virtue of his Episcopal ordination. But the church does say that a bishop may bestow that charism on one or more of his priests, asking that priest to do exorcisms based on his authority. That's important to note because I cannot function outside of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis unless I have permission from the bishop of the other diocese. Again, I work under the direction of Archbishop Charles Thompson, so I cannot leave the Archdiocese of Indianapolis without his permission. Now, demonic activity is classified under two main categories, and tonight I want to speak about both of them. The first one is extraordinary demonic activity, and the second one is ordinary demonic activity. The church recognizes four different types of extraordinary demonic activity. The first one would be demonic infestation. It's the presence of evil in a location, in an object, or in an animal. So think of a haunted house where people hear strange things happening. That's where an exorcism could be prayed by any priest asking God to dispel the presence of evil and to bring in the presence of the Holy Spirit. There can also be demonic vexation, the second type, which are physical attacks. One is receiving marks or bites or bruises on their body from an evil spirit. There can also be the third type, demonic obsession, which are mental attacks. Literally, the devil is trying to get inside of somebody's head where everything that they th think and see is filtered through the presence of evil. And then the fourth type is demonic possession, whereby the devil or some other evil spirit will take control of the person's body, treating that body as if it were its own, using the person's mouth to speak, their eyes to see, their hands and arms to give gestures, their legs and feet to move, to run, and to try to get away. I will say that there is something known as demonic oppression. The demonic oppression is a gift from God. God allows someone to be tormented by the evil one as an opportunity for that person to show their fidelity to God and as a result to grow in holiness and virtue. We can think of some examples right out of the Bible. We think of Job. God, you know, Job didn't do anything wrong, but God permitted Satan to afflict Job. And if you know the story of Job, he's lost literally everything. His body is covered in sores. His wife says to him, curse God and die. And how does Job respond? He beats his breast and he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Meaning, if things be good, I glorify God. If they be bad, I glorify God. In other words, you know, my personal situation means nothing when it comes to God's rightful place in my life. Another example is St. Paul himself. He talks about the thorn in his flesh, the messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. We think of some of the great saints of the church, St. John Vianney or Padre Pio. He's one of my favorites. Padre Pio used to refer to the devil as old Bluebeard. One night he says he was trying to sleep. He heard some rustling in his room. He turned over in his bed and said, oh, it's only you, old Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he just rolled over and went back to sleep. Now, how many people could we do that if we thought the devil was in our room? We'd be throwing the covers over our head, acting like we disappeared, and we would be praying like you wouldn't believe. But again, no one would have suggested that Job or St. Paul or Padre Pio needed an exorcism. Again, they did not do anything that created an entry point for the demonic into their lives. God permitted it as an opportunity for them to show their fidelity to God. And we know that with Job, at the end, God blessed him in so many ways because of his fidelity. 
The tradition of the church has maintained four criteria in evaluating the validity of cases of demonic possession. So there are four things that I'm trained to look for. The ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual. So if I'm trying to determine, am I speaking to this person as an individual, or is the demon now speaking to me through this person's body? One of the ways that I can help make that determination is whether or not the person understands a different language. Demons don't have to learn another language. They don't have to go to school and study Spanish or Latin or anything like that. It's the nature of an angelic creature that when they were first created, God gave them infused knowledge. It's like downloading information into a computer. So they don't have to learn anything. They can just call it up. And even when these angels fell, Lucifer and his demons, they still retain that angelic quality of having infused knowledge. The second thing I look for is extraordinary superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual. The third thing is elevated perception, that the person has knowledge about things that they should not otherwise know, and that would lead me to come to know that this is a demonic entity that is speaking to me and not that person as an individual. And then the fourth thing I look for, probably the one that all of you are familiar with, is in an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as being blessed with holy water, and there's a strong negative reaction, being shown a crucifix, having a Bible in the presence, and even begin reading from the Bible. So all of these could be an indication that a demon is present. It's also possible to know that when symptoms of the demonic are observed. When demons manifest, there are bodily contortions. In Mark 1, 26, we read, the evil shook the man violently. There can be change in the voice. And we know in Mark 5, 5, it says, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. There can be a change in physical appearance, such as foaming at the mouth, the eyes rolled in the back of the head, there can be unpleasant odors. There can be a change in the temperature of the room, whereby it becomes much colder, uncontrollable laughter, screaming, and hysteria, the hissing and the resemblance of the movement of a snake. I've seen demons manifest, and the person drops to the floor and begins slithering like a snake. There can also be levitation. You know, the first exorcism that I witnessed back in 2006 in Rome was here I'm talking to this little Italian lady and her husband. She's trying to explain to me why she's possessed. And I'm thinking, this doesn't seem so bad at all. The priest training me, Father Carmine, he came into the room. He put a roll of paper towels on the table. He walked back out of the room. He came back in and tied a plastic grocery bag onto the radiator on the wall. He walked back out of the room. He came back in with his purple stole on. A stole is a sign of the priestly office. He had holy water with him, and he had the rite of exorcism in his hand. And he began to pray the rite, and he blessed the person with holy water. The demon manifested. This little old lady, her eyes immediately rolled in the back of her head. She began to foam at the mouth, began to growl and snarl and throw out obscenities at the priest. Father Carmine, the priest, he just continued to pray. He reached over, tore off a paper towel. He wiped the foam off this lady's mouth. He threw it in the plastic bag. It just kept praying. And I'm thinking to myself, what has my bishop gotten me into? <laughs> but it was a good lesson to learn from Father Carmine that the focus is not on what the devil is doing. The focus always needs to be on what God is doing. And I always remind people that if you're relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if we're relying on the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, that's exactly the right place where we need to be. Now, all of these can be indications of demonic possession. But before proceeding with the official right of the church, there is a protocol that we use here in the United States. So I'm trained to be a skeptic. I should be the last person to believe that somebody is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. 
the church says I need to reach moral certitude, meaning beyond a doubt, the person in front of me is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. Here in the United States, the protocol, step number one, is for the person to have a psychiatric evaluation. Now, the church is not denying that the fact that a person could be possessed. Sometimes people will say to me, Father, if you want a psychiatric evaluation, that means you don't believe me. But the reality is, if somebody has to go through a exorcism, they need to be mentally strong and in a good place. The second thing is the person needs to have a physical examination from a medical doctor. So the church wants experts in the mental health field and in the medical field to weigh in on the matter, basically answering the question, is there something about this person's condition that is outside of your scope, your knowledge, your expertise? The church is not asking the psychiatrist or the doctor, do you think this person is possessed? The church herself will make that determination, but the church wants the best possible information, which is why she asks experts in these areas to weigh in on a case. The third step of the protocol would be for me to meet with the person and to do an intake questionnaire. The Vatican has put out a questionnaire that the exorcist can use that will help me determine if this is truly something demonic, then what was the entry point for the demonic into this person's life? Because knowing where the entry point was in the prayer of the church, that entry point is closed. And then step number four, very important, is that the person is brought back into a life of faith. So either somebody resumes their spiritual life, which they abandon, or they come to Jesus Christ for the very first time. I noticed something inter interesting. 2017, I had the opportunity to travel to South Africa with a colleague of mine to give talks to the bishops of South Africa, to give talks to priests and deacons in Pretoria and Johannesburg and in Cape Town to train exorcists and even to do exorcisms in South Africa. Parts of the world where people have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ, exorcisms are one and done. They don't need to be repeated. People often ask, why are they repeated like here in the United States? Why do the prayers have to be prayed more than once? And the answer seems to be this. In the apostate world, meaning people who knew the good news of Jesus Christ and then they walked away from it, it does seem that demons have a tighter grip on these people. Again, they knew the truth, but they chose to walk away. The next step would be for me to look for those four extraordinary signs of demonic activity, speaking languages otherwise unknown to the individual, superhuman strength, elevated perception, and an aversion to anything of a sacred nature. Now, the Bible presents us with very specific instructions on how to get victory over the devil. Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil a foothold. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking him whom he may devour. In James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The truth, however, is that far too many people today are giving the devil a foothold. They are not being sober and vigilant in their faith, and they're certainly not resisting him. I believe that the devil today has not upped his game in the world, but I do believe that more people today are willing to play the devil's game. And the reason for that is because many, many people are walking away from their Christian roots. So how do people play the devil's game? When it comes to the extraordinary activity of the devil, there are eight main ways that I have seen over the years. There are certainly many ways that people can do this, but these seem to be the dominant ones. <clears throat> so number one would be ties to the occult. So the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus. It means hidden or secret. 
It focuses on knowledge of the paranormal. It's associated with things like palm reading, going to see a median or a psychic, the use of tarot cards, playing with a Ouija board, the use of a pendulum, the practice of yoga, Reiki, magic, horoscopes, witchcraft, and I even mentioned knocking on wood. Anybody here ever knock on wood? Don't raise your hand. You're like, I don't dare answer that now after you said that. Just because you've knocked on wood, I don't think you're possessed. But I use that as an example of how things of an occult nature can become so mainstream that we don't even think about what it is we are doing. So knocking on wood, and there is an insurance company that has that slogan, stopknockingonwood.com. Every time I see that, I'm like, that's exactly right. (laughs) But knocking on wood is a druid practice. It's the belief that spirits live in trees. And when you knock on wood, you're asking the spirit that lives within that wood to come to your aid and grant your request. Anything that has to do with the occult is a violation of the first commandment, meaning that no thing or no person should ever take the place of God. We we read that in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, and also in Leviticus 19, 31. So the devil cannot be used by humans. The devil will always ultimately end up using us. That's the danger with even going to see a psychic or a median. The church would say they do not have the power they claim to have. The power they have is coming from the devil himself. And either they know it and they go along with it, or they somehow have been duped by the evil one in believing they have the power, even though it's coming from the devil himself. So why has there been a rise in the occult And there are five reasons I would give. A lack of an effective religious experience for many people. In other words, people today have become bored with Christianity. They'll tell you as a Catholic, the Mass is the same old thing. I don't get anything out of it. When people say that to me, I ask them, tell me about your spiritual life Monday through Saturday. Tell me about your prayer life. What have you done? Because if all you're doing is giving God one hour a week on Sunday by going to Mass, it's a no wonder you're bored. And I also like to remind them that if we don't put something into it, we're not going to get anything out of it. It would be like going to a bank and saying, I'm here to make a withdrawal. And they look at you and say, you don't even have an account. There's nothing for you to withdraw. So if we want something out of Mass if we want something out of our Christian faith, then we have to invest in it. And if we're not making an investment into it, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. The second reason there's been a rise in the occult is weak religious convictions. People don't know why they're Catholic. They don't know why they're Christian. And because of that weakness, again, the occult seems to have quite the lure. There's a loss of certain important Christian values. There's a darkening of the meaning of life. Look at the world in which we live today. There's a lot of chaos, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of darkness. People are in isolation. People are struggling for meaning and purpose and direction in life. And ultimately, only God himself can give that. There's also been the rise of indoctrination into the world of magic by means of books, so-called masters, weekend courses, conferences, personal contacts with those who practice magic. Children are exposed through magic through stickers, cartoons, animations, certain types of music, video games, movies, TV series, and novels. The most powerful channel today, obviously, is the Internet itself. And that brings us to the second way that people open themselves up to extraordinary demonic activity is what I call the entertainment industry. Think of Halloween, and again, movies and TV shows and literature, games, computer and IT gadgets. All of these things today are creating a fascination with the devil. And we all need to remember 
The devil plays on a person's memory and imagination. If we're putting all of this junk into our minds, then the devil has quite the feast, things that he can feed on to instill fear as a way to pull us further and further away from God. The third entry point is a curse, the opposite of a blessing. It's doing harm to someone with the help of the devil. Curses are only effective if we are weak in our faith. We cannot control what somebody else does. They can go to, you know, somebody that practices magic and try to put a curse on us. We can't stop what they're doing, but we can make sure that we're living right in the eyes of God. If we're a Catholic, if we're going to Mass, if we're praying, if we're celebrating the sacraments, if we're reading the Bible, the devil is already on the run. And if we think of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, again, if we put on the armor of Christ, if someone is trying to place a curse on us, it will have no impact whatsoever. There was a couple in northern Indiana that owned a mortgage company, and they fired an employee for being a bad employee. And after they terminated her, she told them that she was a witch and she was going to curse them. So she went through the business and put satanic symbols all throughout the building under chairs, under tables, behind pictures, in files of their clients, sacrificed animals in the front of the building and in the back of the building. When I went up to visit, there were animal parts scattered around the back and the the front entrance of the place where the woman had conducted these curses using animal sacrifice. So they were terrified. And so I prayed with them, celebrated mass in their business, and everything was okay. They called me a week later and go, she cursed us again. And then I prayed with them and then they're like, she cursed us again. I said, you're, you're not breaking out of the cycle. Again, you can't control what she's doing, but if you're getting back to church and you're praying, then you're going to come to know that these curses have no impact on you whatsoever. Several years ago, I was giving a talk at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. There are 400 college kids in this auditorium And as I'm speaking, a young man comes up along the side aisle and he has a crystal around his neck and he's kind of aiming it at me when I'm speaking and I can hear him doing some little incantations, moving his lips. So he believed that he was trying to curse me when I was speaking. And I just looked at him and said, are you for real? (laughs) And then he quickly ran out the door. But again, curses are only effective if we're weak in our faith. The fourth entry point is being dedicated to a demon. It seems kind of far-fetched, doesn't it? One of the exorcisms in Rome, and I believe I shared the story the last time I was able to visit uh, St. Vincent's, is a young lady in Rome who shared with me that when she was born, her mother had dedicated her to Satan because her mother did not want her, blamed God for giving her a child that she did not want, even attempted an abortion, which was not successful. So she blamed God for giving her this child and said, I will get even with God by dedicating my daughter to Satan. And she said for the first 12 years of her life, she underwent satanic ritual abuse. At the age of 12, she ran away from home, ended up on the streets of Rome. In her late teens, she found her way to the priest who was training me, and he began to do prayers of exorcism to cast out the demons. The great thing about this young lady is that she went on into religious life. She became a nun. She knew what it was like to live on the street, to have nowhere to turn to, and to this very day, she ministers to street children in the city of Rome. Think about that. Somebody who was demonically possessed is now a religious sister, one who has dedicated their life to God. And that lets us know I think of the words again of St. Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. We can take what the devil is doing to us and we can turn it around and use it against him. The devil believed that what he was doing to this young lady was going to destroy her life, but ultimately it led her to God and into religious life. The fifth entry point is abuse, which creates emotional wounds that can cause a person to seek help from the wrong sources. 
I did an exorcism here in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis a few years ago. The woman told me that growing up in Mexico, she was 50 years old when I was speaking with her. At the age of seven, her father began to rape her. I hear horrific stories. She said her father raped her over a period of five years. When she turned 12, her father turned his attention to her younger sister. She felt abandoned by God. She was broken. She was shattered. She turned to, in her culture, brujas, witches, curanderos, shamans or wizards who said that they could help put the pieces of her life back together. But she only found herself shattered and broken even more and more and more. So a friend of hers invited her to come back to church, and then she actually manifested in the presence of the associate pastor, who then contacted me and said, would you interview this lady because I don't know what's going on. So the lady agreed to meet with me. Exorcisms cannot be performed on someone against their will. They have to want the help of the church. So I'm there sitting at a table. Here's this young priest. Here's the lady. Here's her friend. She's telling me the story about being raped by her father. She begins to sob uncontrollably. And then she looks at me and says, can you help me? And I looked at her and said, Jesus is going to help you. And as soon as I said that, her eyeballs turned green, her pupils became slanted like a serpent, and the voice came out of the mouth and said, who's he? He has no power over us. Well, at this time, her friend literally jumped over the table to get away from her. This newly ordained priest falls to his knees, and he begins rattling off Hail Marys like a machine gun. <laughs> so I walk over, and I put my hand on the head of this person. The demon is manifesting, growling at me, snarling at me, cussing me out. And I reached in my pocket, took out holy water, and did a blessing. And as soon as I did that, the demon began to shriek and cry and collapsed onto the floor. I ended the session right there because... If I do an exorcism, I need to prepare myself. You know, the devil does not get to decide where or when he will be defeated. The church herself will make that determination. As a priest, I will celebrate mass beforehand. I will go to confession. I will spend time in prayer. I will determine who else will be present. I will determine the location. It will always be in a, chur a church or a chapel. You know, I always jokingly tell people an exorcism is never performed in an abandoned house on the dead end street at midnight during a thunderstorm. <laughs> That's a great movie, but again, the devil does not get to decide. A week later, we are back at this parish. We're in the chapel, and whenever I do an exorcism, the person will sit in a chair in the front of the room. I will be right in front of them. And then they always bring a family member or a friend. So her friend did come back, the one who leaped over the table. She did come back. This young priest, he came back as well. And as we began to pray, the rite itself begins. So this little red book is the rite. Always begins by blessing the person with holy water, which recalls our baptism into Christ, by which we have all become a new creation. There is the litany of the saints calling on the saints to come and to be present in this particular prayer of the church. I will then read one of the Psalms. Psalm 91 is a very powerful one. I need not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day. I read the Gospels, accounts of Jesus performing exorcisms or even the prologue of John's Gospel, the word became flesh, which speaks of the incarnation. And then... I will get the person to try to make a renewal of baptismal promises. Again, during all of this, the manifestations are taking place because the devil is being tormented by these aspects of our faith, which he himself has rejected. One of the parts of the rite, and this is what expelled the demon, is the insufflation prayer. That's the breathing on of the face of the person invoking the Holy Spirit Wherever the Holy Spirit is present, an unclean spirit cannot remain. And so here I am staring the demon right in front of me. We're like two feet apart. 
and the demon is growling and snarling, and I just simply went like that and invoked the Holy Spirit. The chair flew back 10 feet like it was hit with a strong wind, and then there was a shriek and a cry. The woman comes flying up out of the chair, and she falls on the floor. Myself and the other priests go over and lift her up, and she's beaming as bright as the sun. And that's one of the ways that I know that a demon has truly been cast out. There's literally a glow. And probably the best way to imagine it is think of a painting of a saint. What's always around their head, it's a halo. They are not radiating their glory. They're radiating the glory of God. So much so did they unite their will with the will of God. And demons can try to masquerade that they have been cast out. But in my experience, I always look for that glow, if you will, from the glory of God that lets me know that the demon has been cast out. One of those exorcisms in Rome, the demon tried to convince Father Carmine that it was gone because right halfway through the exorcism prayers, it sounded like the actual person and no longer the demon. And the voice said, thank you, Father, for praying today. There's really no need to continue. I feel like the demon has been cast out. Thank you for praying today. You can stop praying now. There's no need to continue. You can stop praying now. I'm fine. And then Father Carmen had just picked up his holy water and went like this. And then the demon shouted, I told you I was gone. <laughs> and again, I was still like this at the time. The other entry point, number six, would be a life of habitual sin, which means no longer following the divine will. Remember those three guiding principles I mentioned? You may do as you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. It's when we begin to objectify evil and to accept sin as a particular good. And when we do that, that can be an entry point for the demonic into our lives. The seventh entry point that I'll mention is inviting a demon into your life. It's cultivating relationships with demons. I've had many examples of this over the years. A young man who told me that ever since he had declared Satan to be his father, he found a certain power or vigor. He said it's just so exhilarating to know that if Satan is your father, the power that you have. And his family was trying to get him to come back to the church, but he wanted no part of it. He wanted his relationship with the devil in his life. Now, we can't force him to go through an exorcism, but we can certainly pray that he has a change of heart because, again, the human person is capable of conversion. We can make bad choices, but we can also repent. And as long as we repent, God is always ready to welcome us back. Another example of inviting a demon in an elderly man in Indianapolis, he uh, was not Christian. His family belonged to another Christian church. They were concerned because they told me that throughout his life he had always cultivated relationships with demons. And they were concerned that he was nearing the end of his life. And they were concerned about his eternal salvation. So when I went to meet with him, he told me this. He said, I have no desire to be with God in heaven for all eternity. He said, I want to spend eternity with these demons that I've befriended throughout my life. Now, I'm hearing this thinking, this is crazy talk. And he even told me, he said, this is my choice. It's, this is what I desire. He goes, I want nothing to do with God. And the family is like, what do we do with that? And I said, the thing we need to do is pray. We can pray. You know, you think of the good thief on the cross. As long as we turn to God, it doesn't matter when, it just means that we need to do it. And even the good thief on the cross, we have no idea what he did to deserve to be crucified, but Jesus simply says to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. God's love and mercy is the greatest thing that we can know. It's certainly greater than any sin that we can commit, but we have to be the ones to invite him in. The line in scripture tells us Jesus stands at the door and knocks. We have to open the door. He doesn't kick the door down and say, here I am to save the day. 
we have to invite him in because God always respects our free will. The eighth entry point that I'll mention is broken relationships. There's a lot of brokenness that people experience in their lives, but how we deal with brokenness does seem to matter. When we experience dysfunction in our families, do we give in to anger and bitterness, resentment, and revenge? These are the very things that the devil would feed on because he wants to isolate us. He likes broken bits and pieces. Think of the importance of the church. It builds community. The devil is all about division. So again, the best example I can think of comes right out of the Bible itself, the story of the Gerasene demoniac. Jesus arrives in the Gadarene territory. When he gets off the, out of the boat, he's met by the man possessed by legion. He's living in the tombs. Fetters will not even hold him. There's a superhuman strength. Jesus begins to rebuke the demons, and then they ask to be sent into the swine. There's demonic infestation, the demons in an animal. If you know the story, they go into the swine, they race over the hillside, and they drown in the lake. Most people usually stop reading the story at that point. But I would propose the most important thing happens next. The man who was possessed by legion wants to follow Jesus down the road. And what does Jesus say to him? No. How often does Jesus tell somebody not to follow him? So this should be causing bells to go off and lights to flash. Jesus says, no, go home to your family. A man who was living amongst the dead, Jesus now puts back amongst the living. He goes from living in the tombs to being with his family once again. Jesus builds community and community always defeats the devil. Let me say something now about ordinary demonic activity, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So most of us don't ever have to worry about extraordinary demonic activity. Certainly head spinning, pea soup flying can get anybody's attention, but all of us do need to be aware of how the devil tries to trip us up in the ordinary circumstances of our daily lives. And when it comes to the ordinary attacks of the devil, I suggest that he has a four-stage plan of attack. All the words begin with the letter D. It begins with deception, which leads to division, which leads to diversion, which leads to discouragement. So deception... So on our daily journeys, we all encounter something or someone who is intelligent, concealed, powerful, destructive, and who wants to intrude into our lives in ways that are harmful and destructive. And we need to pay attention to these attacks for their primary goal is to fracture our lives in such a way that we are pulled further and further away from God. The devil begins with deception. He inverts reality. He turns things inside out and upside down. He wants to pull us off track, and he proposes to present a lie as a truth. There is a deception. And we know that when the devil speaks, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John eight forty four. Remember what the devil says to Eve in the garden? Surely you will not die. You will become like gods. So again, what does he do? He presents deception, a lie, trying to get us to buy into it. So all of these deceitful promises have to do with the future. Gratitude looks to the past. Love looks to the present. But fear looks to the future. We want to be in control, and we want to know the outcome. That's why there's so many people today that will consult a psychic or a median. There's no room for hope and trust. The end result with deception is that the devil has misled someone and they now find themselves in the midst of scandal or depression. What's the first thing that Adam and Eve did after they sinned? They went and hid. Can you really hide from God? And the answer is no. 
So people are buying into the lies of the devil, and rather than owning up to them, they try to justify them. Because when we give into a lie, into the deception, what does God want us to do? Repent. I always want to imagine when God went to Adam and said, Adam, what have you done? Remember his response? That woman, he couldn't even call her Eve. That woman you placed here, she made me do it. Eve, what have you done? The serpent made me do it. It's always passing the buck and not taking personal responsibility. But I always like to imagine what would have happened if Adam had said to God, I sinned against you and I'm sorry. Own it. If we own it, then we can overcome it and receive God's mercy. But when we don't repent from the deception, then it leads to division. We should not be surprised that the devil directs his energy to division and disunity. He desires to divide people from each other, from God, and from their very selves. The devil works against our very redemption in Jesus Christ, which reconciles us to God and allows us to share in the unity of the Holy Trinity. The devil wishes that all of us would collapse with him into eternal death and everlasting alienation from God. He does this by drawing us into a world of deceit and untruth, whereby we become broken. So again, once we've given into the lies, we've not repented, it leads to division, our lives are just a big old mess. And what does God want us to do then? He wants us to repent. But when we don't repent, then it leads us to diversion. The devil desires that we divert ourselves from the pathway of God. He moved the people of Israel who were on a journey to the promised land away from the worship of the one true God to the worship of false gods. Exodus 32, 1 through 8. They worship a golden calf and adopted the pagan practices of the nations around them. We call this idolatry, and it is still a weapon that the devil uses today, substituting a product of our own creation for the uncreated God. Why, are, why is there such a great fascination with Eastern spiritual practices today among many people who grew up Christian. And I would suggest because they bought into lies, it led to division, they were broken, and then they began to look elsewhere. Rather than turning back to God and seeking forgiveness, they turned elsewhere, trying to put the pieces of their lives back together again. And then once we have given in to diversion, a substitute for God, what's the end result? discouragement, the loss of hope, meaning, and purpose. Discouragement is the most dangerous threat to the spiritual life. It's evident in the tiredness that marks so many people today. It manifests itself on the joyless faces of people that we see in supermarkets, restaurants, walking down the street, even sitting in the pews on Sunday. In Dante's Divine Comedy, there's a sign above the entrance to hell that reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter. These words ring true for all those who have been swept into the dark and deep hole of discouragement. Discouragement leads people to make decisions, to stop trying, to pull back, to do something else, or just to come to a halt. These things are of such great interest to the devil because he knows that they can derail our journey to God. In the Christian tradition, we call discouragement acedia. It's a word that comes from the Greek, which translates, I don't care. Do you think that's a sentiment that we see a lot in the world today? I just don't care. It speaks to things like melancholy, sloth, laziness, especially in regards to religious obligations and practices. It can be the result of things like being tired, overwhelmed, intimidated, and experiencing personal disappointment. When people have journeyed through the stages of deception to division to diversion to discouragement, 
they arrive at a crossroads. One pathway leads to death, always spiritual, but sometimes physical. Think of the rise of suicide in society today. But we're Christians, we're people of hope. The other pathway leads to discipleship. People recommit themselves to God, they repent, and they begin to live in a manner pleasing to God. So the final thing I'll share with you are some best practices. So if anyone believes that they're experiencing extraordinary or ordinary demonic activity in their lives, these, this is what they should do. Maintain fidelity to God. Do not try to give in to change. Don't look for a substitute for God. Be patient and exercise humility. Have confidence in the Holy Spirit who will lead, guide, and direct you. Take the initiative. Intensify certain spiritual practices that may assist us in confronting the devil's attacks. I mentioned some of these earlier. Regularly attend Mass and receive Holy Communion. Seek out a regular confessor for the sacrament of penance. Anytime we confess a sin, we place it in the hands of God. And once we place it in the hands of God, the devil cannot use that against us. As Catholics, we can spend time in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, incorporating Marian devotions into our daily routine, routine praying the rosary, using sacred scripture for prayer and reflection, using other devotions such as the Divine Mercy Prayer, the Chaplet of St. Michael the Archangel, prayers to patron saints, and so on. Use sacramentals such as holy water, blessed salt, blessed objects, and sacred images. And most importantly, we need to f resist. We should fight back. Do not give in to the lies of the devil that you have been abandoned by God or feel nothing of God's presence. Ultimately, we need to fear God and not fear the devil. What does it mean to be a God-fearing person? It means to live in awe of God. You look at your life and you say, wow, look at what God is doing in my life. All the blessings that I have received. When confronted firmly and decisively, the devil is weak and a coward. I like to say the devil is like a cockroach. When you turn on a light in a room that is full of bugs, what do the roaches do right away? They scurry to get out of the light. And we can say that in an exorcism, the church is throwing the light of Jesus Christ on those who are confronting the attacks of the evil one. And the light of Christ will always make the devil flee. The enemy is essentially a coward. He will only attack when met with weakness. When resisted, he flees. The devil only attacks us at what he perceives to be our weakest point. So we need to take advantage of what he's doing to us. We know that if someone is attacking you, they've kind of sized you up. They determine this is your weak point. That's where we're coming after you. But if the devil helps you identify a weakness in your spiritual life, then you can use that against him. Because then you know exactly the area in your life that needs to be strengthened spiritually. And then finally, the devil does not possess any particular strength. If we are willing to resist him, we will see that the enemy's power was never more than a facade, and it will crumble before us. Ever see the movie The Wizard of Oz? They're all terrified. They arrive in the city, and they're scared of the great wizard until the dog pulls back the curtain, and it's just a guy speaking into a microphone. The devil is the same way. You know, he's always giving this false impression that he is more than he actually is. And so with that said, it's 7.30, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have for like the next 15 minutes, I think, Father Jagan. She asked the question, did the older man who wanted to be with Satan... Did he ever convert? And unfortunately, I don't know that story because they never did reach out to me again. Yes? So from the extremes that I've seen over the 17 years, extraordinary demonic activity 
There was a lady here in Indiana who was possessed by seven demons. So whenever somebody is possessed, it's usually a cluster of demons, and there's a higher ranking one. There's a hierarchy in the angelic world, and there's a hierarchy in the demonic world. And we know that who's in charge of the demonic world? The devil himself. The devil believed that it, it's better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. And so when the angels fell, they fell from all choirs. So there is a ranking. The person possessed by these seven demons, six of them were the first to go. They could not resist. The one demon that was the last to go told me his name was Leviathan, a demon mentioned in the Bible, the great sea monster. And it said that it did not have to leave because it had been invited in. And this person had invited the demon in, and the demon then was making a claim. So we can give power and the authority to the devil by what we do, but we also have the power to renounce that and take it back. So the devil, this demon wanted to convince this lady that once she said it, it was one and done. But again, the human person is capable of conversion. We can realize that we've done something wrong and we can repent. And we can say that in an exorcism, the devil is commanded to return that which it has stolen, namely a person created in the image and likeness of God. So there's that one extreme extraordinary. And you go to the ordinary demonic activity. I think it's just the, the lack of joy again that is just witnessed on so many people today. You just see people that's like they don't have I mean, Pope Francis even talked about it, just walking around with a long face. There's just no joy. And you know what? There's a lot of things in the world today that we can complain about. But I would also suggest that there's a lot of things that we can also celebrate. And the question would be, is the glass always half empty or is it half full? And you know what the Purdue graduate would say? <laughs> the glass is twice as big than it needs to be. But again, as Christians, we should be joy-filled and hopeful. And if we just blend in with everybody else who lacks joy, it's no wonder that people are leaving the church. Because ultimately, if we are radiating joy, people will look at us and say, whatever you have, I hope it's contagious because I need it. And we can say to them, what I have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we share that with them. And they come to Christ as well. Um, you talked about that we, that we should not go to mediums and, and people who try to foretell future or things like that. But do you believe that there are people who can prophesy and or... So she's asking the question about people that go to see psychics and mediums. But it is, is it possible that some people do have a glimpse into the future? The only one who knows the future is God himself. The devil doesn't know the future. The devil is extremely intelligent with this infused knowledge. He can use deductive reasoning to kind of watch us, and then he can might guess what we might be thinking or how we might act, and then present that as a fact. But only God knows the future. But it is possible, and I would say the people that you may be referencing are mystics. People who are mystics, God has given them a glimpse into the future. So the question is, where is it coming from? And when I meet with people who always tell me, I have a gift, I have a gift, I have a gift, I always hear the word I, I, and I don't like that word because it usually speaks of pride. But if somebody says, God has given me this gift, that's what I look for. To me, that's the clear distinction. It's not what this person is doing it's what God is doing through them. Think of Moses in the Old Testament. When Moses stands before Pharaoh and says, God says, let my people go. And then Moses' staff turns into a serpent. Seems like he's performing magic, doesn't it? Because then Pharaoh's magicians do the same thing. But what's the difference between Moses and the magicians? Moses is a man of God. It's not what he's doing it's what God is doing through him. And I think that's always the distinction. It's, is it God working through someone or is it the evil one working through them? 
And if somebody truly is a, a person of God or a man of God or a woman of God, they're not there for the almighty buck. There was a gentleman one time in Virginia who tried to tell me that he was possessed. I worked with him, got him in touch with a counselor in Virginia, the priest in, in Virginia, and uh, he wasn't Catholic, but he was convinced he was possessed. But it was determined that he was suffering from a mental health issue. But he believed that it was demonic. He went to a professional exorcist who told him he was possessed by five demons and it was going to cost $1,500 each to cast them out. The man paid the money. He was so desperate. So there are people today that prey on people's brokenness. The church does not charge anyone for the ministry of exorcism. It's a ministry of charity. And the church, again, helps Catholics and non-Catholics alike. Now, again, I have a warped sense of humor. It helps me maintain my sanity in this ministry. So there is a joke amongst exorcists that says, the danger is that if you don't pay your exorcist, you might get repossessed. <laughs> that is only a joke again. There is no charge. Yes? So speaking languages otherwise unknown to the individual. So I'm curious as to how many languages you're trained to recognize um, and how you distinguish a language of the tongue. Gibberish. Because yeah. I thought you were first going to ask, there is something called glossolalia. People can speak in tongues. But again, that's the language of the Holy Spirit. And that's something completely different. So again, in working with the person, the intake questionnaire, does that person know any other languages? So uh, I do know bits and pieces of some. So I studied Spanish for seven years. I learned enough Italian to order off the menu from the three months <laughs> that I was in Rome. My grandparents were from Slovenia, a small little Eastern European country. I know some of that. There's only two million people that live in that country. It's half the size of New Jersey. It's a part of former Yugoslavia. It borders Croatia and, and Austria and northern Italy. The likelihood that somebody else speaks Slovenian is slim to none. In fact, my dad, and he's still alive, he's 94. When the telemarketers call him, he always picks up the phone and speaks in Slovenian. And then they hang up on him. It's a language that sounds like Russian, but he uses the... Latin alphabet. The Slovenes were converted under the Emperor Charlemagne, so they're all Roman Catholic. And then I studied Russian for a year at IU. So before going to the seminary, I spent two years in Bloomington, Indiana. So I like to tell people conversion is possible <laughs> even in Bloomington, Indiana. <laughs> two years at IU, and then I thought off to the seminary. Any other thoughts or questions? Way in the back. Yeah. Um, so, with levitation and other things like that, is it that sort of the devil would make it appear that that's happening to? It could be. So, the, the manifestations yeah. could be a trick. Because, again, remember the devil plays on a person's memory and imagination. imagination. So, is it actually taking place? Or is that what the person believes is taking place? That's why I've learned over the years not to focus on the manifestations. So in Rome, here's a good example. During an exorcism, someone started to levitate. When the demon manifested, they started to rise out of the chair. And I'm looking at this, and Father Carmine again is praying. He's looking, he's praying, he reaches over, puts his hand on the head of the person and pushes him back down in the chair and just keeps praying. There was another priest in the room at that time. Afterwards, we were talking about it. He never saw it. He never saw it. I saw it. Father Carmine saw it, but he did not. So that's the danger when people focus too much on demonic manifestations. Because again, what's the devil doing then? He's sowing confusion. One person saw something, and the other person didn't. 
and it was happening at the same time. So I think again of Padre Pio where, oh, it's only you. Good night. <laughs> you know, don't focus on the devil, but focus on what God is doing in this particular prayer of the church. D this doesn't scare me. I don't worry about things that go bump in the night or anything like that. Because again, I know that the power of God is greater than the power of the devil. And we should never put God and the devil on the same playing field. The devil is still a creature, and a creature can never be compared to the creator himself. Yes? Is there uh, importance or significance in naming the demons? In some of the Gospels, the, the demons are named, and I don't know if that's something that you're taught, or is there any, any importance in, in bringing the name of the demon out? In the older rite of exorcism, a part of that was the demon was commanded to name itself. That was the exorcism rite of the year 1614. And the new rite came out in 1998. Which re so from 1614 to 1998, the rite remained unchanged. It's not included in the new rite for the demon to name itself. I would suggest that you know, asking the demon its name is really a form of interrogation. And it really isn't what the devil says that matters it's just simply interrogating him because the devil is infuriated that he's being commanded by a creature that he considers to be inferior to himself. And you can't really trust the answers that are given because, again, the devil is the father of all lies. And if, if the exorcist starts to pay attention to the answers to the questions, then the devil is in charge. So I've used the old right. If you're stably appointed by your bishop, you can use the old rite of exorcism. But I, I don't really care about the answers. I just like interrogating, you know, what's your name? How many are there? What's the date and time of your departure? How did you enter in? And things like that. And just keep throwing them out there. And then eventually the devil is just so infuriated again that someone that he considers inferior to him would dare command him. And then that's when the manifestations really begin. And in an exorcism, everything the church is doing is forcing the demon to manifest because once it manifests, the battle against it will begin. Yes? So the question is, can the person see the devil at one minute and not the next? The, the, the challenge, the question would be, you know, how do demons move? They don't catch a plane or a car or a bus. They move by thought. So their movement is faster than, than light. They just think it, and that's where they're at. Demons, as purely spiritual creatures, we would say they're neither here nor there. We say they're here or there if they're choosing to act there, which it goes back to trying to figure out why, what was the entry point, or if a house is haunted. It's not that the demon lives in the house. It doesn't have an address like you and I have. Oftentimes, it's what people are doing there. Does somebody perform a seance in that house? Were they involved in some occult activity? that would cause ghost hunting. See, I would suggest that all these ghost hunting shows you see on TV, it's not that these demons live at the abandoned hospital. It's the very things that these people are doing that's attracting the attentions of the demons that's causing them to manifest. And if these people think that they can control the demons, no, they're, they're like the mouse that the cat is playing with. And eventually going to bite off their head. I've had many ghost hunters over the year call me because they were experiencing demonic attacks. But again, spirits move by thought. So it is possible that somebody could see something one minute and then it's gone. And then it could be also then there's demonic obsession because the devil's trying to get into your head. And then you start questioning and doubting what you see or what you think. You start thinking you're going crazy, so to speak. Demonic obsession 
is the most difficult of the four types of extraordinary demonic activity to deal with. It's more difficult than infestation, vexation, and even possession itself. Because when it comes to obsession, usually there's a mental component and a demonic component happening at the same time. And then trying to pull the pieces of that apart is very, very complicated. Yes. You'll, get, you'll go next. Yeah. Would you explain a little bit further about yoga? Especially yoga if it's done solely as an exercise. So she's asking the question about yoga. And if it's done solely as an exercise, is there any harm to it? And the challenge would be, is somebody strong enough in their faith that they're never going to be attracted to the spirituality that's associated with it? So the word yoga means to yoke. And the question would be, what are people yoking themselves to? And there is a spirituality that goes with yoga. Sometimes people will say, well, it's Christian yoga. We're praying the rosary to yoga. But again, it's like knocking on wood. Does somebody begin to do yoga just for the exercise? And then somebody says, well, what about this? And the next thing you know, you're now practicing the uh, spirituality that goes with it. Just because somebody does yoga doesn't mean I think they're going to be possessed. But I do think it could be an entry point into the world of the occult. And the question again, does somebody know their faith well enough and are they well rooted in it? Usually comes up when people ask about literature in Harry Potter books. Is there a danger for children to read Harry Potter? And my response would always be, if your child is picking up Harry Potter, when's the last time they picked up the Bible or the Catechism of the Church? So do they know Harry Potter better than they know the Bible? If so, that's where the problem is, because they're not able to filter what they're reading about the world of magic through our faith and what it is that we believe. And that goes back to yoga. Can people filter that through our Catholic belief and identity? I had a priest tell I travel a lot giving talks. I had a priest tell me one time, a priest told me he was bored with his Christian faith and wanted to explore Buddhism. But that's the danger is that you slowly get off course and then the next thing you know, you're way out here. Yes. And, and people will tell you that in the, in the world of yoga, the different poses and postures are actually religious expressions when it comes to certain deities within. <laughs> Exercise is good. The question would be, do people get pulled into the spirituality? That's the danger. Yes. So the question is, how many demons are there? Are they finite? Yes. We would just have to go to the book of Revelation when it speaks of angelic creatures. It says there are thousands and thousands and myriads and myriads, meaning they can't even be counted. And in the book of Revelation, we know it speaks of the fall of the angels where you know, the tail swept one-third of the stars out of the sky. So we don't know. You know there's nine choirs of angels. Can you name them? Add that at seraphim and cherubim and thrones and virtues and powers and principalities, archangels and angels and all of those. But again, everybody has a guardian angel. How many people live on the planet? I don't know, 8 billion people. So we know there's at least 8 billion angels. Start doing the math so they can't even be counted. But the good news is one-third of the angels fell, which means two-thirds didn't. I was never good at math, but... Two-thirds is greater than one-third, so there is that story in the, book, in the second book of Kings where it says that there are, there are more for us than those who are against us. And it is important to realize that your guardian angel is more powerful 
than the devil himself. Your guardian angel is more powerful than the devil himself because even though Lucifer before the fall was the greatest of all the angelic creatures, closest to the throne of God, seraphim angel, meaning the fiery ones, why are they on fire? They're so close to the throne of God. But why is Lucifer associated with darkness? We can say that when he rejected God, the light went out. So there is the world of darkness. But he's an imperfect creature. So going back to St. Thomas Aquinas, if you want a very heady theological statement before you go home and take aspirin, St. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas said, God created the angelic world. St. Augustine said, when were the angels created? He would suggest that it was at the beginning of Genesis where it said, God said, let there be light and it was good because the angels are associated with light, intellect, purely intellect. So God said, let there be light, and it was good. But then immediately the light was divided into day and darkness, but it was not called good. So in there, he said that we could see the fall of the angels. So God created the angelic world, gave them infused knowledge. Aquinas called that evening knowledge. It's the knowledge of things in the natural order, speaking a foreign language, for example. But then God said, now with all this intellect knowledge I've given you, will you then glorify me? And when we glorify God and we unite our will with God, he says we receive morning knowledge. Think of the story of creation. Evening came and morning followed the new day. God created the angels, gave them evening knowledge, and then said, will you now make the choice for me? One third said no, two thirds said yes, the two-thirds that said yes, united their wills with God, received morning knowledge, and now are perfected creatures. The demons that fell still have the evening knowledge. They rejected morning knowledge. They are now imperfect creatures, which again is why a perfect creature in the angelic world in the ninth choir is greater than the highest that fell from the first choir because of the rejection of the divine will. Aspirin is being served at the... <laughs> so what's the goal in our lives? Ultimately, it's to unite our wills with the will of God. Why do angels have wings, by the way? Why are they depicted with wings? Do they actually have wings? And the answer is, they're pictured with wings because it demonstrates their readiness to implement the will of God. God says, do this, and they're like, done, 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 done. Because angels is a word that means messenger. The message they have now is only the message of God. It's not anything of their own because they've united their will with the will of God. The good angels today can never fall. And the bad angels today can never repent. Because when God created the angels with infused knowledge, they were in the presence of all that they could know. So they can't say, well, I didn't know that. They were in the presence of all that they could know. We, again, we can grow in holiness and virtue. We can repent. Yes, Catholics, we say conversion is an ongoing process. But that's not true of an angelic nature. They're in the presence of all that they can know. Once they make a choice, it's set. It can never be changed. Our last question. Yes, you get to be it. Pressure's on. To what extent do angels have access to our memory and can they use our thoughts and memories? So to what extent do demons have access to our thoughts and memories? So demons can watch us and observe us. That's kind of creepy to think about, right? So if you're doing something and you think that nobody's watching, well, that may or may not be the case. But again, if we put an image into our mind and we're back to the entertainment industry, we're watching these shows on TV about all kinds of scary things. The devil knows by observing us what will trigger some reaction and then he knows exactly what he can do. Does the devil really have hooves and a pitchfork and horns and all of that? No, but it's an image that terrifies people. So the devil can use that image to scare. Because remember again, 2 Corinthians, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. 
So it isn't that Satan is always this horrific creature. Sometimes he can appear as someone very appealing as a way to draw people in. So the devil can play on memory and imagination, and that's why we have to be careful about the things that we're putting into our minds. And that's true, again, of literature, TV shows, programs, computer, and all these gadgets and whatnot. If they have a strong demonic character, then that means there's a fascination with the devil, and the devil will use that. Because what's ultimately, does, what does the devil want? Misery loves company. He wants us to be in eternal alienation from God, as are he and his demons. So that would be his goal. People ask me, what did I do during COVID lockdown? So I wrote a book. I brought some copies tonight, if anybody would like them. They're, they're what I paid for them. They're $10 a copy. If you want me to sign it, I'm happy to sign it for you. But it was a way that I shared some of my experiences. I was asked to write this book after I gave a talk at St. Louis University. Uh, Jesuit priest there, Father David McConey. He works with Scott Hahn in Steubenville. So the book was published by Emmaus Road Publishing, and they do a face series every year. So this is the book that I wrote as a way to help educate people about the important topic of exorcism and the importance of always being connected with God. With that said, let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. O God, creator and defender of the human race, who formed us in your own image and more wonderfully recreated us by the grace of baptism, look with favor upon all of us, your servants, and graciously hear our prayers. May the splendor of your glory dawn in our hearts, we pray, so that with all terror, fear, and dread removed and serene in mind and spirit, we may be able to praise you with all your brothers and sisters in the church through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, not in pieces. Everybody have a good night. Yes, you're welcome. And now a word from our pastor. <laughs> what a great blessing we had through Father Rick's And I was amazed to hear a lot of stories. <laughs> and if you stay here, you keep on telling so many stories. <laughs> so the one thing is, do not be afraid today. So you can sleep well and make some prayers to your guardian angel and pray to God in a special way. And God is with you. Thank you yeah. all so much. Thank you. I never told Father Jagan when he was my associate that I stored all the demons in the closet in his room. <laughs> <laughs> Don't open that door. <laughs>